I just appreciate uh, Pastor and you guys opening up your doors for a total stranger to come in here and share the Word of God with you. Uh, but that's what we're going to do. We're going to uh, just share the Word. The Lord Jesus uh, has has brought us here and i um, excited. Thank you, Peter, for helping making this uh, connection. People are asking me, so what's your connection here? I said, I don't know, <laughs> you, know how, you know. How do you know the pastor? I said, I don't, you know. <laughs> um, but thank God for YouTube because sometimes people are able to window shop and see what you're all about and all that kind of thing. So that's why there's all that, you know, equipment back there. Somebody said, are you with the news? I said, no, I'm not with the news, you know. Uh, but I do that so that uh, people that uh, want to know the word that are interested in, you know, looking at their computer before they go find out. Uh, I was just in uh, Ohio uh, and two, uh, about a year and a half ago, the first time I went to, uh, to share at this one church, this lady met me at the intermission time and she said, you know, I'm here and, uh, and I'm really excited because I get a good feeling from what I see when I watch her YouTube videos. But if there's like a bald guy sitting next to me who's just kind of glaring at you, don't be intimidated. He's my brother and he said, I want to come with you to make sure this guy's not a whack job. <laughs> and they came back after the intermission and they came back the next night and now they're leading a small group that's really helping to equip people to walk in, their full, in the fullness of Jesus Christ. And that's what this is all about for me. Now, my mission statement is I mobilize believers to walk in the fullness of Jesus Christ worldwide. Because Luke chapter 6 verse 40 says that when a, a disciple is fully trained, they will be just like their master. Amen. And for a long time, I was wanting to be one of those disciples uh, but I didn't know that Jesus' vision for discipleship, that He's going to equip us so that we would walk just like Him. I sort of felt that there was this theological ceiling that we could never rise above. You know, Jesus was the one who did Jesus stuff. And we're the ones who just sort of, you know, pray hard, uh, try to keep ourselves, keep our nose clean so we don't make a big mess of things. And then eventually we're going to be awesome in heaven, right? It's going to be amazing there. Anybody feel like that? You know, Jesus does Jesus stuff, but that's him. Well, I've got good news for you. Jesus is the same today as he was yesterday. Amen? And he'll be that way forever. The Word of God says that in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Everybody knows that, right? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same, but there's one thing about him that's changed, and I want to let you know what's changed about him. His location. Now he lives inside of you and me. And he is tired of just being amazing in the Gospels. He is no less amazing now than he was then. Now, though, if he's going to be a healer, if he's going to be a savior, if he's going to be a deliverer, if he's going to uh, show sinners grace, it's going to be in his body through you and through me. He's paid an amazing price so that He could put to death and set us free from all our stuff. So that He could move inside of us with all His stuff. Amen? He did not just die on a cross so that He would get our noses counted every Sunday morning. He died not to get you into a building on Sunday. He died so that you would become His dwelling place 24-7. So that wherever you are, the presence of God has arrived. Because you are His dwelling place. Amen? But I was taught the gospel sort of like this. Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. And you believe in Him and you receive the forgiveness of your sins. And you're going to go and be with God when you die. And I had the end of the gospel and the beginning of the gospel down pretty good. 
I believe in Jesus and I get forgiven of all my sins. And when I go and die, then I'm going to be with God forever. Hallelujah. But there was a lot of living to do in between. And I didn't understand, is there any good news for, that, for now? Or do we just limp along, saved by grace, you know, trying hard not to scandalize the name of Jesus, but thank God for, for grace. Amen? Because you know we're all just sinners. Well, I want to let you know that while you were yet a sinner, God demonstrated His love for you in this in dying, sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. Amen? God's demonstrating His love. But here's the cool thing about it. When He saves you as a sinner, but He saves you from being what you were apart from Him. And He makes you a saint. Boom! He makes you a holy one. He makes you a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Praise the Lord. Everything that you were apart from Christ was crucified. I was crucified with Christ 2,000 years ago. Isn't that great? But it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Now, I, I, would have, I memorized that verse. I would quote that verse over and over again. But I'll tell you, my mindset was I would quote that verse and then I would try hard to do the Christian living. Do you understand that? I was trying hard so that I could be just like Jesus. And do you know what? If I could be just like Jesus by trying really hard, then I don't need Jesus. And there's a lot of people who are trying really hard to be just like Jesus by praying just the right way, by, by disciplining themselves just the right way. And it's all about you. And it can be real frustrating because here's what's happening. You're either thinking that you're doing a good job and you're looking down your nose at everybody else who ain't doing as good as you, or you are not doing a good job and you're wondering what's wrong with me and feeling defeated. And sometimes it's the same thing. You just got some hypocrisy going. You've learned how to keep it in the closet over here. And out here, you try to make up for it. But I wanna let you know something. God sees right through all that stuff and that's not his plan in the first place. His plan is not to improve you and to improve me. If He could have improved us, He wouldn't have had to crucify us. His plan was that we be set free from ourselves and that He put Jesus Christ and His life, the very Son of God, inside of us to be our life, to be our identity, to be our source of living. Now, that, that's something that I could have said for a long time. But it had to become real. And it became real through that struggling forward of, of what is this all about? And then all of a sudden, I began to realize by experience that Jesus Christ, His life is supernatural. And see, before I was believing God for supernatural miracles, for healing, for this, for that. And you know, then, you know that's supernatural, right? when a miracle takes place. But then God showed me in the Word that Jesus Christ wasn't just healing the sick by miracles. Those were signs, right? But signs point to something. I think it should be outlawed that you have those signs on the interstate that says, you know, at this, at this place there's lots of food to eat and then you get off and there's nothing. You know, well, it's 10 miles to the right. Well, pfft, that ain't off this road. You put the road, you know, signs down there, right? Jesus, his signs were signs of a life that he was living by 24 seven. There was a life that he brought into the face of this planet. There was a life that was pulsating, that was supernatural, that he brought out of heaven, that pulsated within his chest, amen? And he said, it's not me doing the living, but my Father living inside of me. Praise God. 
He was living by his Father's divine life. In his humanity, he was partaking of the divine nature. And he was putting that nature on display because apparently our humanity was created to be the image bearer of God. So there's a perfect fit. It's like we're monitor screens for, he for heaven. Have you guys ever had a computer and you're getting it set up and you realize, if I don't put this monitor screen on this computer, I've got no idea. If your monitor goes out, you've got, it can have some really cool programs. You got no idea what's going on in there. Amen? Listen, God created us. He created this world and he created us to be bearers of his image so that he could put himself on display in us as we partake of his life, of his mind, of his love, of his spirit, of his power, that, he, that for people to see what's God like. His plan was that all they need to see is one of us. But then we became unplugged. You ever walked into Goodwill or Savers or someplace like that and you got all these monitor screens just sitting there unplugged? Tell you what religion is. Religion is, you got a little dust on you, brother. I'm a bigger monitor screen than you. I'm a flat screen, you're a round screen. <laughs> We have all these ways of comparing ourselves with one another. And then Jesus shows up and the Pharisees are walking around and they're like, we are very rigid, disciplined monitors. We are right here. Well, we do this, we do this, we do this. You don't do it right. We do this, we do this, you don't do it right. And guess what? And Jesus shows up and he's plugged in. He's going And they're like, what is that? Amen? But I want to let you know something. He died and rose again so that he could hook us up. He became a Wi-Fi so that we can log in through him and stop running our own programs. Stop trying to improve your self-image. How about you just let that thing die? Because you were never supposed to have your own self-image. You were created to have God as your image. You're an image bearer of God. Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 says this, When Christ, who is our life, is revealed then you will be revealed with Him in glory. Let me say that again. When Christ who is your life is revealed, then you will be revealed with Him in glory. Do you know that God looks at you and says, Christ is your life. And when people get to see who you really are, they're going to see that you are filled with His glory. You're glorious. Isn't that amazing? Let me ask you, is Christ glorious now? He is. But we don't see it with our eyes, do we? Are you glorious now? Peter said yes. The rest of you are going like, where is this guy taking us? I'm taking you to Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Everybody knows that one. Verse 29 starts a real cool chain of events. Those that God foreknew, He predestined to become conformed to the image of Christ. And those He foreknew, He also called. And those He called, He justified. And those that He justified, one day in the sweet by and by, He's going to glorify that is not what it says. Those he justified, he also glorified. D past tense. <laughs> For all you English majors, that's a cool thing. 
that means that God is not looking at your body apparently. He's looking at your spirit, which would make sense if God is spirit. Amen. John chapter 17, Jesus says, Father, the glory that you have given to me, I give to them. Isn't that amazing? The reason I say this, and I have to start here, is because so often we're so used to running ourselves down and thinking about our failures and our faux pas and all the things that need to be improved about ourselves. We're aware of our shortcomings. Amen? But we need to understand that as far as God's concerned, that is your old man. It's already dead. And part of our mind renewal process is learning to reckon that to be dead. Amen? You put it off. And he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, I believe, he says, now put on the new man who is created in the image and likeness in, of God in holiness and righteousness. Do you understand that you are a new creation in Christ? You preach that around here, right? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. Well, why are we trying to improve it all the time? Why are we trying to get free from it all the time? Why do we make such a big deal out of the old? Maybe we haven't learned that we're free from it. And because we're brand new, we need to put off the old. We don't wear it around. We don't try to improve it. We're brand new creations. We need to learn to live out of the life that Jesus put inside of us. Amen? That is the Christian life. It's the life that He, that rose Jesus from the dead. The life that came into you that made you born again. And that's the life that transforms us on the inside. It has a new character, a new love. It has a spirit of faith, spirit of hope, spirit of righteousness and holiness, amen? So that you walk different because your innards have changed and you've got to learn to live out of that place of the spirit, the new man. The, you are a new creation in Christ. You've been made already in the holiness and likeness and righteousness of God. That's who you are. And that life is supernatural. But don't just receive it. Put it on and walk in it. Amen? I had a buddy of mine who called me aside uh, some, for some time because he had been struggling. And he had heard some of the stuff that God had helped me. So I was meeting with him over coffee. And we got together and he was having all kinds of background noise, you know objections that would come out over coffee. You got to have coffee conversations with people because that's when you find out what are they really understanding. Amen? You think, boy, that was a clear message. That was a great illustration. Everybody goes, yeah, Pastor, that was a good message. And half the people go home and go, yeah, I don't, what is he talking about? <laughs> that's why relationships are really important. I'm glad that that's really a, a powerful part of, of what you're doing here so that you can have interactions about the Word. Well, this guy, he said, so, so you mean to tell me that I can go over there and smash the counter glass and steal all the muffins and when the police come up they I can tell them well don't arrest me that was my old man <laughs> that's not who I am anymore and I said no that's stupid see <laughs> your old man is dead and you're not free to live in the old man you're free from the old man to live in the new the new man is Christ, is one with Christ, is, is, uh, is you containing Christ, living by the faith of the Son of God, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. All right? Isn't that awesome? So it's letting Jesus live his life through you. See, we often have faith in Jesus, what he's done, Jesus being at the right hand of the Father, but we don't often exercise faith in Jesus to live in us and work in us now. But that's how we know Him. Paul said, I consider everything to be lost so that I might know Him in the fellowship of... Uh, what? In the power of His resurrection. 
Amen? So knowing Jesus Christ isn't just knowing about Him, it's knowing Him as your life. 2 Peter chapter 1 says this, that God has made us partakers of the divine nature. So even as Jesus said, it's not me doing it, it's my Father doing it through me. My Father who lives in me does His works. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen you, your life. Some of you are getting it, some of you are like, eh. See, here's the thing. What I figured out is this, is uh, I've got... I didn't just have this from the beginning, you understand? I kind of came up to speed in this. And I've realized from that point that understanding your unity with Christ helps you understand that your entire Christian life is supernatural because it's the life that Christ lives in you. Prayer is a supernatural thing. It's the Spirit of the Son crying, Abba, Father, in your heart, Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Because God made you a son. See, God gave you that identity. He gave you the same relationship, same standing with Him as Jesus. See, Jesus had that by nature, right? He was eternally begotten of God. We got adopted into that standing. Ooh. See, this whole time I was trying to build a relationship with God based on everything I understood from the gospel. And then when I understood the gospel, I realized I don't need to build my own relationship with God. I get to partake of Jesus' relationship with God as my relationship with God. That's a whole lot better because mine sometimes stinks. His is amazing always. Amen? Are you starting to get this? I'm starting to see a few more smiles from, from some people that were going like, what the heck? It's in your Bible. I'm preaching the word to you, okay? I've been quoting it all over the place. All right. Now, all that to say, when you know who you are and how much God loves you, it sets you free to be controlled by the love of Christ. It sets you free from all the fear of man. It sets you free from trying to keep up with the Joneses. It sets you free to walk as an ambassador of Christ. Amen? See, we sing a lot about the love of God, and we want to use the love of God. But Paul said, for the love of Christ controls me. He came under submission to the whole thing. Nothing else has got a hold on me. I don't care what people think so much. Well, my buddy, i got to finish my illustration. My buddy, he's, uh, after he, we talked about this, he said to me, He's, after I talked a little bit more, he said, I think I just got it. And he said, can I share it with you? I love it when, you know, people get it when they can share it with you. That's why small groups and discipleship relationships are so important. What did you understand? You got to let people talk it out. Say it in your own words. So here's the thing. He said, <clears throat> when I was growing up, my dad was a deadbeat. And my mom and dad got divorced at a very young age. But through some court agreement, I wound up having to spend an entire summer with him in high school. And uh, at that time, I was really into BMX bicycle racing, the pedal bikes, not the motorbikes. But my mom would not let me take my BMX bike over to my dad's house. Um, And so, but my dad, he had this old Pee Wee Herman Schwinn bicycle that was sitting out behind the garage. You know, the big ones with the 46 inch rims and the, you know, the wraparound handles and the triangle seats with the springs and stuff. It's hard to look cool on those things. But he said that was all I had. And so that summer I started uh, doing some odd jobs around the neighborhood and bartering. And I scraped all the rust off, put a new paint job, got new uh, handlebars and, and seat for it. And I'm finally not completely ashamed to be seen on it towards the end of the summer. So I start riding it around the neighborhood and one of the tires popped. So I walked it back to the house, threw it in the garage. It turned out it was Friday. And that weekend, my mom had made arrangements for me to go to a summer, a weekend camp. So somebody came to pick me up at the camp. And, uh, uh, and my, now on the way out, my dad said to me, well, son, uh, is there anything I can do for you while you're gone? 
and he said, Dad, if, you know, I've been working all summer long. I don't have much time when I get back. If you could uh, fix the tire for me, that'd be awesome. And his dad goes, no problem. He said, you know, my dad said that, and we had kind of started to make some progress in our relationship. And he said that, and I realized it was still really hard to trust him. So I was kind of like, okay, Dad. But inside, I was sort of like, we'll see. So I went off to my camp, and he said, I came back. And we pulled in the drive, the garage door was open. I looked in the garage and there leaning against the side of the wall, just where I left it was my bike, tire still flat, had not been touched, had not been moved. And he said, I saw that and all this pain and frustration and anger and just, I wanted to spit nails and cry or whatever. He said, I saw it. So I just grabbed my bag and I ran into the house through the garage and I was gonna go upstairs and just, uh, you know, throw my, self in my room and, and put my head in the pillow and just cry and you know I didn't want to see my dad I flung open the door and there in the middle of my bedroom was a brand new top of the line BMX bike and he said I, I, I just started crying he said it was the first time in my life that I ever remember crying tears of joy and uh, and I said man that is an awesome story I'm gonna steal it and <laughs> but I said what does this have to do with what we've been talking about and he and he said I think up till now I've kind of thought of the Christian life as is trying to fix up the old bike and I've really been trying you know felt like God wasn't happy because my bike didn't look right and it was old and it was broken down and the tires didn't work and all this kind of stuff so I'd ask God you know help me be this help me be that help. and I got you know, quite frankly I was getting kind of frustrated because I knew that's what God wanted me to be and so I was just kind of God help me do this help me be that help me do this and it just didn't ever seem like things were working and now I've realized his plan is not to help me do that he helps me but he does it be, by giving me a brand new life that's perfect, complete, and intact. And he's waiting for me to abandon all this stuff about me as if everything's depending on me and about me. It's about Jesus being all that he is in me. And I just need to go upstairs and get on this brand new bike and learn how to let Christ be my life, Christ to be my identity. And if I fall off the new bike, I'm not getting on back on the old one. I'm getting back on the new bike because the new bike is amazing. And I'm like, you're right. You got it. Except for one thing. I said, if this were really a real biblical illustration, your dad would have gotten you a Harley. <laughs> because Jesus comes with power. Amen? But you still have to be the one who rides. You've got to learn how to trust and sit your butt on the seat and be seated with Christ in heavenly realms where God says you already are. Whether you've known that or not, God has already taken you onto the other side of death, onto the other side of judgment with Christ, and He's placed you there and seated you there. Now, you're not living to try to get into heaven one day. It's really good news. It wasn't wrong that when you die, you get to go be with God. Congratulations. When you come to know Christ, you have died. You were crucified. Amen? And now your life is in Christ, hidden with God. And now you live from the life of Christ. Live from that relationship. So... I know Peter introduced me as Andy, but I need to let you know, this is not Andy. This is Jesus wearing his Andy suit. Amen? And in the presence of the Father, I wear my Jesus suit. I look great in my Jesus suit. And Jesus is not ashamed to be wearing his Andy suit. And I'm sharing that with you because that's true of you too. Amen? Well, here's the cool thing about it. After, you know what comes before Hebrews 13, 8? Yes. It's really complicated. It's in the Greek. Hebrews 13, 7 comes before 13, 8. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 13, 7. I want you guys to see this. I'm going somewhere. 
Still got some time, right, Pastor? Pastor said I could take as long as I want, and then people just leave when they want to. <laughs> no, he told me what time to stop. He's a good pastor, guys. All right, Hebrews 13, 7. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and consider the results of their conduct and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you know that whole thing about Jesus being the same today, yes, yesterday, today, and forever? It's a follow-up. It's a completion of Hebrews 13, 7. So therefore, you remember the way that these people who brought you the message of the gospel lived, and you live like them and imitate their faith. Well, that's really cool because you know what? They lived in the power of God. They lived in freedom. They weren't going around trying to, pr pl to please the religious establishment. They weren't going around worried about whether they had enough seminary credentials. They were following Jesus. They weren't following traditions. They were following Jesus. And they were, in, they were living by faith. And they were walking in holiness. And they were walking in compassion. And they were helping people. Amen? And people were coming to know Jesus. And their lives were being transformed. So this is exciting to me. I remember when Jesus began to show me, listen, I don't want to just dwell in you and make, give you an amazing relationship with a father. I've done all that so that living in you, you living in me, that I can bear my fruit through you. I've left you here so that you can be controlled by the love of God and the love of God can come through you to do for people what only God can do. And I started realizing that's the heart of healing. That's the heart of words of knowledge. That's the heart of all the spirit. It's that. It's not about our ministry or our anointing or our gifts. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 12, whoever believes in me, the works I do, he'll do also. We got any believers in here? We got any whosoever's in here? I like that because I wasn't really good at being anointed. I wasn't really good at being, you know, spiritually gifted, but I was okay at being a whosoever believer. So I started being a whosoever believer, but I started really believing. Instead of believing that Jesus could do that or might do that, I know Jesus does that. And now he lives inside of me to do that. That's why he said, and even greater, because I go to the Father. See, until he went to the Father, he couldn't pour out his Spirit to come dwell inside of us. See, he's very confident he can do his amazing works through us. And even greater, because he could talk about the kingdom, because he, but he couldn't bring anybody into it. We get to bring people into it. Amen? And do the same works. That's what Jesus believes. I remember... Uh, we went on a mission trip to, to India, Peter and I and some others. And the pastor who was hosting us, he had started a number of churches out in villages. But those villages, it's a Hindu country pretty much. And uh, he told them, he said, they're coming here to teach you how to walk in the power of God. So while they're there, they want to walk around the village and help the people that are hurting. So don't waste their time with people with just hurt knees and, you know, shoulder pains and all that kind of stuff. Find the lame, the deaf, the, 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 the blind. People that when they're healed, that there will be a testimony that reverberates throughout your village. And uh, so we, we, did a, we did a little conference and we had the pastors minister to one another. And a lot of them had little, littler things, right? But hey, listen, if it's yours, it ain't little. Amen? <laughs> you say, so don't, don't hear that and say, well, I was going to get prayer, but I'm, no, not today. No, that's not for you, okay? I wanna, I'm setting up what happened. They, they took us and our team to this one man. He had been in some kind of an accident four years ago, and he had been paralyzed from the neck down and just basically laying on his porch. His whole family was Hindu. And uh, so I, we went over and the Word of God says believers will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Anybody got hands in here? Uh, we got believers. We got believers with hands. Hey, what if, what if we've got what we need? So 
I put my hands on the guy and others from our team did, and I just believed for the power of God to flow in him. See, the 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says this. He says, the one who belongs to the Lord is one spirit with him. See, it was the spirit of Jesus that made him amazing. It wasn't his education. It wasn't his parental upbringing. It wasn't the town that he came from. It was the spirit that lived in him. He died so that those of us that belong to him would be one spirit with him. When we learn to operate by faith and to release the spirit to do his thing, we don't do it, but he does it through us. Amen? You got to ride the Harley. You got to open up the throttle. You can't run as fast as that Harley can go. The power comes from the motorbike. Amen? But the motorbike doesn't go anywhere without you opening up the throttle. So we laid our hands and I just believed. I didn't say anything. I just believed for the power of God to go into him. And after about 30 seconds, I just spoke to him. I said, right now in Jesus' name, everything that was damaged, be whole and be healed. Why do I say that? Instead of, oh, Father, please come and touch him. Well, go read your Bible. Nobody did that. Jesus didn't do it. He said, I can't heal anybody. It's my father does the healing. But he knew he was an image bearer. So he looked at the father and said, I can only do what I see my father doing. And apparently he never saw the father asking somebody else to do it. Apparently he saw the father saying, I'm with you. You bear my image. Don't speak to me about the stuff. Speak to the stuff in my name. Represent me. And you know what? We're his ambassadors. James and John, silver and gold have I none. But what I have, I give to you. You don't have to get heaven to give you something. Heaven, the kingdom of heaven dwells in you. You need to release what you have. So we laid hands on that man and we spoke to him to be healed. And I said, okay, now move move do something that you couldn't do faith without works is dead amen move do something you couldn't do before he instantly he started moving his arms he started wiggling his legs and us and and i said is that new see i'm working through a translator he said yes that's new but he says that won't help him i said well we're not done yet i said I, he said, I, uh, then we had him sit up took our hands off of him and said be strong be whole and he sat up and he said i said is that new he said, yeah, that's new, but that won't help me. Now, we're not done yet. We got him up, had him walking around, took our hands off of him. He's walking around the porch. He said, is that new? He goes, yeah, that's new. I said, will that help you? He goes, yeah, this will help me. <laughs> and then we spoke to him about the gospel. Do you want to know how this happened? And we explained to them that the very God who created the heavens and the earth is the true and the only God. There are other spirits who want to be worshipped, and God cast them out of heaven. But human beings became deceived by them and began to follow them and became enslaved to all kinds of fears and lusts and pleasures and murders and all kinds of stuff like that. But God loved us enough that he humbled himself, came into the human race as a man, lived among us, lived a perfect life for us, died the death that we deserve to die as a sacrifice unto God and God raised him from the dead to break the power of death over our lives to demonstrate that Jesus is Lord of all and that through him we can be forgiven we can receive eternal life and the power of the Holy Spirit starting now and going on forever would you like to receive this Lord Jesus and they all 12 of them about you know we were counting you know like a nose but it was about a dozen of them prayed to receive Jesus right then and started following the Lord. Well, that's cool. We've heard about that kind of stuff happening over in India. Well, just yesterday, I'll just tell something fresh. Walking over to the Saturday market, started to walk into the store and there was a guy standing out front and he was smoking a cigarette. And I just learned, you know, when you learn to let the love of God control you, you start treating people like they're worth dying for everybody some of that just starts with make some eye contact and be pleasant don't be a midwesterner 
all wrapped up in your stuff and you stay out of my stuff and I'll stay out of yours. Make eye contact. Engage the world around you. Conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders. Let your speech be seasoned, as it were, with grace so that you may know how to respond to each one. Amen? What does that mean? Talk to people, people. How do you talk to them? With grace. With favor. You speak peace to this house. Don't be a jerk in Jesus' name. Walk in there. He's smoking a cigarette. I could have said, what you smoking a cigarette for? God don't like smokers. Good luck. That'll be the end of that conversation, right? Jesus hung out in the smoking section, I think. He hung out with sinners, people who brought prostitutes to parties, people you've probably been told to stay away from your whole life. When you're controlled by the love of God, you can't stay away from anybody. You're not letting them influence you. You're so filled, you're the influence. Amen? So this guy's smoking a cigarette, and I said, hey, how's it going, man? He goes, great, good to see you. And I was like, he said, it's been a long time. And I said, yeah, it has. <laughs> you know, I, I never met this guy before. I thought, well, maybe I forgot somebody, you know. I forget people all the time. And, uh, and then I, I, I said, what's going on with you today? He said, oh, I came out here, I got a watch. And I said, let me see it. And we talked about his watch for a while. And I said, man, that looks really cool. And, he, and I said, yeah, me and my daughter, we're going to go in here and grab some lunch. We're going to get some euros. It's not gyros, folks. We found out. We asked the owner of the restaurant, the Greek guy. He said, it is euros. I was right. Anyway, Peter said it was gyros. <laughs> anyway, so we went in there, and we were going to get some euros. And what ended up happening, it, I'm talking to this guy. I said, well, I'm going to go in here. But hey, before I do that, while I'm out and about, I love to pray for my neighbors. Is there anything going on in your life I could pray for you about? And he goes, well, I'm, going, I'm doing pretty good. I said, how about healing? Do you have anything giving you aches or pains, any sickness or something not going right in your body? He goes, my knee's all messed up. And I said, well, that's, that'll work. I said, let me just put my hand on your knee real quick. You know, I could have just taken him by the hand. However you want to do it, that's fine. Believers lay hands on the sick. A handshake works just fine. But this guy, he seemed real nice and open. I mean, he was treating me like a friend. I was treating him like a friend. So I was like, this ain't going to be a problem. I said, let me just put my hand on your knee. Put my hand on his knee and said, in Jesus' name, all pain come out. But it's not what I say. It's not a formula. You understand? I'm speaking to it in the name of Jesus. I'm believing. See, Jesus called this prayer. We don't think of it like prayer anymore. But Jesus called it prayer. He said, have faith in God and you'll speak to the mountain and it will move. So whatever you, re whatever you stand praying, see, there's a, there's a command going out this way, but there's an ask coming in this way. It's like a light switch. You're sending power that way, but you're drawing power this way. Same thing. So I'm speaking to the mountain. You don't speak to God about the mountain. That's dumb. Do it Jesus' way. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you'll do the same works that I do. Why do you do it different? Because you don't, you believe, well, that's the way Jesus can do it. That's not the way he, then, see, you think that the two aren't one. Jesus came to live in you. See, believing in Jesus gets you saved. Believing like Jesus opens up the door for Him to, to live through you, do His works. I like that song. <laughs> That's all right. So anyway, I put my hands on the guy's knee and said, in Jesus' name, be healed, pain come out, knee work properly. I said, move that around. Tell me how it feels. Faith without works is dead. Tell him, move it or do something, right? Jesus healed most of the people just by telling them, stretch out your hand, rise and walk. Told him to do something, act on it. And he moved his knee around. He goes, that's a lot better. I said, does it have any pain in it? He goes, when I do that, there's a little bit of pain left. I said, well, let's get the rest of that out. So we did it again. In Jesus' name, knee be completely healed, pain come out. You know, if it doesn't go the first time, Jesus hadn't changed. 
He's still the same. He's healer. Amen? He lives in you. I'm not checking to see what God's will is. You look at the Bible to see what God's will is. Jesus came demonstrating the will of God. Amen? He said, I have come to do thy will, O God. Well, if, if sickness is God's will, Jesus went around screwing up God's will all over the place. Put that in your theological head and go, <laughs> amen? Jesus never treated sickness and disease like it was part of God's plan for anybody. He always treated it like it was a work of the enemy. Well, what about that guy? And they asked him, he said, well, Lord, why is this guy born blind? You know, or it was for the glory of God, right? Well, Jesus apparently for the glory of God meant so that I could get it out of him. He didn't leave him blind for the glory of God. That isn't, that isn't what the Word of God says. Amen? Isn't that cool? So you just letting Jesus be Jesus in you, loving people. Gosh, this guy got healed. And I said, do you know, do you know how that happened? He goes, yeah, that was Jesus. I said, do you know Jesus? He goes, I do. And I said, you following him? And he goes, I am. I said, not perfect. He said, not perfect, but I am. I said, that's cool, man. Hey, let me just pray a blessing over your life. And prayed for him and said, it's great to meet you. And he goes, yeah. So we didn't even know each other, but God gave him the impression he knew me. Isn't that funny? You can do that with old people. You treat them real nice, you know, hey, how's it going? You know, and, and you know, about halfway through the conversation, it's like, do I know you? You know, I'm used to forgetting people now, you know. But you just treat people like they're your friends with a friendly demeanor. If they want to throw up a wall, let them do it. But don't you walk around trying to protect yourself from people that Jesus died for. Amen? I remember... So he got healed, and then I had walked in. Peter's talking to somebody, so I started talking to some other people sitting on the bench. Was able to pray for some other people, share the Word of God with them. And then this guy comes over, the guy that I met outside smoking. Well, he's done smoking. He came inside. He goes, this guy just healed my knee. I said, I didn't heal it, dude. It was Jesus. And, you know, so he's, he's going around being a little evangelist now. But listen, sometimes... When you realize that this is who Jesus is, that he'll do this through you. It's one thing to agree with it. But one of the deceptions over the church is that we've mistaken agreeing with what the Bible says or agreeing with what the pastor says as faith. Faith is not what you agree with. Faith is what you live by. The just will live by faith. You say you believe. Okay. Show me. That kicks it over into a bit more faith, doesn't it? It's like, ooh, I got to really be ye doers of the word. That There's a faith that activates. Gird up your minds for action. See, we think that mind renewal is just memorizing a bunch of Bible verses. Well, it starts there. Mind renewal ends with you living out the word. You become a living expression of the Word. You are letters from God. You are living epistles. Jesus was the Word made flesh. Now you, because Christ, the living Word, lives in you. You are God's epistle and people are reading you to see what's real in your life. They're not looking for your doctrinal statement. They're looking for love. They're looking for compassion. They're listening to your words to see if there's any music so that they can start singing along. Amen? Music isn't enough. You've got to have the life of Jesus. You've got to have the life of Jesus. But you've got to mix the, the music with the words so that they can start to sing along too. Amen? Amen? I see some heads going up and down. Y'all don't see, say nothing around here, do you? <laughs> Cat's got your tongue. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Very good. Well, we're getting close towards uh, quitting time, apparently. I could go for a while, but I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters. I've, I've kind of, it's like drinking out of a fire hose a little bit. 
Um, so I want to encourage you. Uh, my website is fullspeedimpact.com. There's some books over there. Uh, both of them that I brought with me are 15 bucks a piece if those are of interest to you. I also have a, an online trading and mentoring academy. Um, if anybody's interested, you can uh, sign up to get my newsletters. And then tonight, I think we're over at, what's that place? LifeGate. LifeGate at 7 p.m. for a healing miracle service. Um, this morning, as I was uh, sitting down, I got impressions about a few things. Um, just want to be faithful to the Lord to call those out. Uh, one was uh, like carpal tunnel or like inflammation, like in the elbow or in the thing, like uh, some, some, yeah, yeah, how about that? Great. And the guy sitting behind you, great, come on up. Uh, the other one uh, was either was either like an ovary thing or a, or a hernia thing. I don't have ovaries, but there was something down here. Uh, so that was one um, and then there was some knee stuff uh, uh, that was going on and then there was something on uh, like the underneath the, the shoulder blade uh, back here uh, which is really cool um, so if any of you have uh, those things now here's the cool thing about it I wanted to call those things out specifically because I believe that the Lord here, here's my operating procedures okay the Lord, when He shows you specific stuff, do the specific stuff, and He's showing you for a reason, so just be faithful, because some of these people might not have come up for prayer if I had not called it out. However, some of you are sitting here, well, I hope He gets a word of knowledge for my thing. Guess what? I've got a word of knowledge about you. <laughs> so get up here if you got a thing. <laughs> And we will pray and believe Jesus to get that thing out of you. Amen? And uh, if there's anybody on the worship team that wants to kind of, or if, if you want to play some music in the back or something like that, that's fine. If you're here this morning and you don't have a particular thing that needs healing, uh, and you still would like some agreement in prayer, you, you can come forward. That's fine. I'll be happy to minister to anybody.